When he heard that this film was in great danger uh, and needed to be restored, he immediately committed himself to raising the money for it through the Film Foundation, the Hollywood Foreign Press, and the Louis B. Mayer Foundation. And, which is really amusing because uh, the Louis B. Mayer Foundation, I know, has done a great deal here. But when my husband wrote his book about what it was like being in the film business, he said, I've jumped off cliffs, I've flown in dangerous planes, I've been in a room alone with Louis B. Mayer. <laughs> now, Louis B. Mayer ruined the career of Michael Powell's great hero, uh, Rex Ingram, who taught him to be a director because Rex Ingram and Louis B. Mayer thought a lot. Uh, and unwisely, Rex Ingram asked, uh, uh, refused to have Louis B. Mayer's name on his film, so it said Metro uh, Goldwyn, not Metro Golden Mayer. Not a very smart thing to do, and he paid dearly for it. So I think it's just lovely that the Louis B. Mayer Foundation uh, has supported this film. It's a wonderful circular thing. We almost lost this film twice because the Rank organization hated it. J. Arthur Rank, with the big gong, which you're going to see at the beginning of this film, um, had supported Powell and Pressburger, two of England's finest uh, filmmakers, for all during the war they made a string of magnificent films. Uh, and they were supported because they were commercially viable, and um, J. Arthur Rank sort of wasn't paying attention to them. And then the Red Shoes came along, and he said, oh my god, what is this? This is terrible. Uh, and he tried to ruin the film, unfortunately, and uh, said to my husband and his great partner, Emmerich Pressburger, you will no longer choose the films you want to make. We will choose them for you. And my husband said, nobody ever says that to me, and left. Um, which was too bad. It was the end of a great collaboration. Fortunately for us, uh, the two Americans looked at the film Arthur Krim and Bob Benjamin from United Artists and said, listen, we'll try it in America. They had had some success with Powell Pressburger films before. And uh, so they said, let's bring it to America and we'll see if it goes. They uh, took a theater on uh, 45th Street in New York and converted it to a movie theater. And it ran for two solid years in New York. It was so incredibly appreciated. And then it became a huge hit all around the world. In fact, it's way at the bottom on Variety's all-time grossing films uh, ever. Avatar is way at the top, and it's way at the bottom, but it's still there because it became such a huge hit. Uh, it made Moira Scheer into a, a star immediately. And um, anyone who saw it back when it came out never forgot it. It was originally intended to be made for Merle Oberon, who was uh, dating Alexander Korda, the great uh, English, really Hungarian producer working in England, and he wanted a film for her. So uh, Emmerich Pressburger uh, came up with the idea of taking the, the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, The Red Shoes, and in which a girl is danced to her death by a, a pair of red shoes that she craves. Uh, and make it into a film for Merle Oberon. In that case, if it had been made back then by Corda, they would have used a double for the dance scenes, and Merle Oberon would have done the acting parts. And when Emmerich Pressburger, after World War II, said to Michael Powell, would you be interested in making this, Michael Powell said, only if a ballerina plays the part. What a brilliant idea that was. And so he began to find, look for this ballerina. And Stuart Granger actually suggested, first of all, uh, Moira Shearer, because he used to go to the ballet and he saw this beautiful redhead. Um, and so Michael Powell cast her. And uh, she could dance, she was beautiful, and she could act. So this was really wonderful that they were able to find her and pair her with the incredible other actors in this film, Anton Volberg, who plays the part of Lermontov. Lermontov was really designed or inspired by Diaghilev, the great ballet impresario from Russia, Alexander Korda, and Michael Powell. I think they're all in there. <laughs> and um, so they finally had a dancer. And then when Michael Powell started to tell people what he wanted to do with the film, he was so daring with what he wanted to do that many of his collaborators said, you want to go too far. And again, Michael Powell says, no one says that to me. When he said, I want to be backstage all the time, I don't, we'll hardly ever see the audience. You see the audience a couple of times, that's all. 
Um, we want to be backstage with the artists all the time. I want them to, I want to show the great love these two young dancers have for each other by freeing ourselves from the confines of the proscenium arch, letting them fly through the air. I want to see uh, ocean waves crashing up on the stage. And his art director said, oh my gosh, you're, you're mad. So we removed the art director. <laughs> and a wonderful German, uh, Hein Heckroth, who was a painter, was hired, and he just makes the whole film seems like a, paint, a painting to me. It's just beautiful. And then again, the cameraman he had used for many of his brilliant films, The Canterbury Tale, I Know Where I'm Going, was a black and white cameraman, maybe didn't understand Technicolor as well as uh, some other people. So he was removed, and the great Jack Cardiff who only recently died, unfortunately, uh, was brought on. And this was his great uh, break in life. But he understood Technicolor because he had been in the Technicolor labs. He'd been trained there. And so he grew up with uh, knowing exactly how to use Technicolor. And you'll see it's just completely gorgeous here. Same thing with the uh, composer. They removed the original composer. And Brian Easdale, whose score for this film is wonderful, was brought on. And so it went, and they all went and jumped off the diving board with Michael Powell. <laughs>